Thank you very much. Um, so Ionic Rare Earths, we're developing uh, a rare earth supply chain, uh, sourcing uh, both magnet and heavy rare earths from a, a unique asset we have in, in Uganda. Um, also looking at downstream refining and, and magnet recycling. So just our disclaimer. Uh, so uh, just expanding a little bit on the, the three pillars of the organisation, you know, we are looking towards developing that integrated full life cycle rare earth organisation. Um, Makutu as a, as a source of, of magnet and heavy rare earths, um, it's a large mineralisation, um, approximately 120 kilometres east of Kampala in Uganda. Uh, we're working through a mining license application process at the moment. We expect that we'll have all of that completed um, over the next few weeks uh, with a mining license uh, expected to be awarded in the first quarter of next year. Um, the large system, so a long life asset, low capital, simple, um, and, and a responsive uh, project where we can scale up based upon um, what we expect is going to be significant increase in demand for our, our basket of rare earths. The refinery, um, given the, the landscape at the moment for rare earth refinery refining, uh, especially for heavy rare earths, is completely dominated by China. We have a product that can only be processed in China. Um, there's a handful of, of refineries that are in operation at the moment um, within China. There's obviously a lot of interest from China in our basket. And in order to open up the, the value and the, the ability to market our products to potential customers, strategic partners um, in both the US and, and Europe, we are looking at developing our own refinery. Uh, we've completed a scoping study and we're in the process now of finalising preferred locations in the US. Um, that scoping study we anticipate is going to be finished by the end of this year, um, which will provide some metrics on the, on the opportunity. And the final pillar is recycling of magnets. So uh, secondary sourced end-of-life magnets, um, you know, recovered from... Uh, offshore wind turbines uh, and the like. Um, we are working on a demonstration plant for the technology at the moment in Belfast, um, and we expect to be able to start producing approximately 10 tonnes of magnet rare earths uh, in 2023. Uh, that'll provide us with obviously a platform to start looking at, looking at rolling out modular magnet recycling uh, across Europe and the US. Just our corporate snapshot, uh, market cap uh, of around 163 million Australian at the moment um, and just, just shy of 23 million Aussie in the bank at the moment. Uh, so this is the, the supply chain in China. This is where all of the, the rare earth processing capability has been developed, uh, underpinned by you know the, the, the technology uh, and the, uh, the human capital that's been developed in China over you know 50 plus years. Uh, the Chinese Society of Rare Earths has 100,000 participants. Um, and so as we look to build alternative supply chains outside of China, it's not about developing the right assets. It's also about developing um, the people and the capability to unlock those, those baskets, uh, to be able to separate them and turn them into value-added components. And so what we're doing with Ionic, uh, we've got the mining, we're working on the refinery, and we're in the process now of engaging with metal makers, alloy makers, magnet makers on putting together the individual blocks, the supply chain components to be able to start to, to, to integrate our unique basket of rare earths with those customers uh, in the EV space, in the offshore wind, in military and defence applications where the moment the only source for those products is China. Uh, so just a bit of a landscape of, of where China gets their rare earth from and I suppose the importance of this slide is just to give some context about how China addresses their, their rare earth requirement. Um, they have a handful of hard rock projects which provide bulk tonnes of um, you know, light rare earth, hard rock mineral concentrates and then they operate as many ionic absorption clays as they can out of southern China and Myanmar. Um, so you can see the distinction on the, the southern China uh, provinces uh, and the, the large number of dots reflecting the, the number of ionic absorption clay deposits in operation relative to the, the light blue, um, which are typically 
large scale, hard rock, bulk volume, low value, light rare earth mineral concentrates. Um, over the last five years, we've seen China ramp up their capacity on light rare earth mineral concentrates because they can. These are freely abundant, um, readily available in the world. The one thing they haven't been doing is increasing their production of heavy rare earths from the ionic adsorption clays. Why is that? They're running out. Um, they're in, the, uh, in Myanmar at the moment, increasing their production out of Myanmar um, to the extent now where the heavy rare earths coming out of Myanmar is now exceeding what is being produced within China. Um, and those Chinese refineries are still running at well below capacity. Simply put, um, they're running out, they don't have enough, and it's only a matter of time before uh, Western end users will be curtailed by the fact that these, these molecules are simply not there. So um, that alternative supply chain that we're looking at developing within, within ionic rare earths, uh, starting from the mine at Makutu, it's a large mineralized system. We've already defined a, a mineral resource of over 500 million tonnes at 640 parts per million. Being an ionic absorption clay, um, that, that grade is in line with, with some of the Chinese operations. It's a low capital modular development. We process the ore via a, a process similar to heap leaching where we, we dig the material up and we wash it with a salt solution. We produce a, a mixed rare earth carbonate product, which is a value added product, um, which can then go into a, into a purpose built refinery. Importantly, the product has no radionuclides. So it's a key distinction to the hard rock projects, which as they upgrade the, the mineral composition or upgrade the, the mineral content in their product, they're also upgrading the presence of thorium and uranium in the product, which then ultimately leads to downstream processing issues, as we've seen with, with companies like Linus in Malaysia. Our refinery, um, so we're working on that, that refinery flow sheet at the moment. The, the capacity of that flow sheet, um, the ability to separate the individual rare earth elements is tailored to the specific baskets that we're processing. So it's important to understand that not all refineries can treat all products. They have to be configured to a particular basket um, with some flexibility around minor adjustments on the individual elements. Um, again, why are we doing it? Because we have a basket that can only be treated in China. So in order to bring that product into Western end users, we have to develop that facility ourselves. And we are working on that downstream supply chain, working with potential metal makers, working with magnet makers on starting to unlock that ex-China supply chain. The basket, uh, it's a very unique basket. There's nothing like it um, available for, for Western End users at the moment. Uh, there is one other ionic absorption clay being developed at the moment in Brazil. Uh, the only issue with that is that the Chinese have locked up the, the supply of that asset for the next 20 years. So when you're looking at where are, this, where are these elements gonna come from for um, EV manufacturers ex-China, uh, there really isn't a lot coming online, especially the dysprosium and the terbium, which is criti critical for making the, the magnets that operate at high uh, temperatures required to get the most efficient uh, E-drives. And uh, obviously there's no point in producing these materials going into um, increase the, or uh, deliver a, a net zero carbon policy if we're not doing it in a sustainable manner. So the strategy of the company has really been around making sure that we deliver a project with a, a, um, a high set of ESG guidelines um, so that we're able to leave the mining jurisdiction once post mining is completed um, with effectively a, an improved quality of life, more services, uh, better employment opportunity, better food security for our local stakeholders in Uganda. Um, Bring in the magnet recycling completes the circular economy of rare earths, enables us to bring on supply of, of uh, end of life materials. Um, and, and so again, completing that circular economy of rare earths is, is a great opportunity for, for Ionic. Um, just the location of the project relative to um, Kampala in Uganda, and obviously, you know, we're, we're very fortunate in that all the infrastructure is already available at the project site. Uh, this will afford us the ability to develop Makuta with a very low capital. Um, we're anticipating the capital is going to be in the vicinity of 130 to 150 million US dollars, um, which will be able to produce somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 tonnes of rare earth oxides uh, with the ability to scale that asset up uh, in time, um, funded by free cash flows generated by the project. 
Um, we're a member of the UN Global Compact, which again is helping the company set the framework in place to address not only our desire as a company um, to be a, a good corporate citizen, uh, but also to help address some of the requirements identified in the Uganda National Development Plan around food security, employment, industry, services. Uh, so we think that that's a, that's a great opportunity for Ionic to be a, um, a key enabler in Uganda. We've completed a Digby assessment. Um, that was our maiden score, double B, which uh, was a very good initial um, rating and provides us now with some key opportunities to improve that score over the next 12 months. Uh, that's our basket composition. So, um, you know, it, it is a unique basket. Most of the other rare earth projects being developed in a Western context are light rare earth dominant, dominated by low value lanthanum and cerium. Um, you'll note in our basket, it makes up about 27%. Um, so the remaining basket, 73%, are the high value paying rare earth elements. Importantly, it's a basket that enables not only EVs and offshore wind, but key military applications like F-35s. Um, so we see huge appetite for a number of, of strategic partners and the ability to meaningfully help develop a, uh, a heavy rare earth stockpile. Um, that's the landscape of refining capability today. Uh, it's dominated by China. The blue dots reflect the heavy rare earth refining capacity globally. Um, and uh, the orange is the, the light rare earth capacity. The supply chain and the ability to take a, a mineral concentrate and convert that into a value added component or value added products. Um, we're effectively doing the front end up to the refined rare earth oxides. We'll be uh, engaging with metal makers um, on those further uh, value addition steps and, and we'll update the market accordingly. Where are we at the moment? So we're in deficit. Neodymium, praseodymium are in deficit as of next year uh, and dysprosium and terbium are in deficit now. So as the world inquire, requires more, uh, forecasts from Adamus indicate that by 2035, we have to replicate China's current capacity just to supply enough NDPR for all of the EVs that have been committed to. Um, but when it comes to dysprosium and terbium, which can't be thrifted out, they've thrifted it out as far as they can, uh, the desire or the requirement now is to replicate China five times over. Um, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty big statistic and, and I don't think um, the EV sector really quite understands just what needs to happen. Um, we've just got back from a couple of days in Detroit and, uh, and I think they're a little bit shocked at what's coming down the pipeline. On the magnet recycling, um, the landscape, it's dominated by China again, um, and about 40% of magnet rare earths currently come from recycled materials. So we see an opportunity to move into that space and provide an alternative option for, um, you know, stakeholders in Europe, the US, the UK, to start to be able to generate internal supplies of um, domestically produced magnet rare earths. Um, Whilst at small scale, it will have the ability to be modular in nature, which means that we can roll these out, have various facilities across Europe and the US and the UK. Uh, we've recently got a grant from the UK government to accelerate the development of this technology. So we're working through a demonstration plant, um, which we're building in Belfast in the UK. The technology is very unique in that it can not only extract the rare earths from the, from the magnets, but it can then separate them into the individual rare earth oxides, which means that the process is agnostic on magnet quality, which is a very unique um, attribute compared to other recycling technologies available at the moment. So we do see ourselves as having a, a key advantage uh, over our, uh, our potential competitors in this space. Finally, I'll just leave you with the value proposition as we see it for, for ionic rare earths. Obviously, we've got a tremendous asset with Makutu. Um, it's a large, unique ionic absorption clay. It's proven. Um, it's got the potential to be a multi-decade producer of magnet and heavy rare earths in an environment where this material is simply not found elsewhere. Um, a low capital development means that we can get Makutu into production relatively easily um, and start producing those rare earths uh, within the next couple of years. Um, from a geopolitical, import, uh, ge geopolitical uh, viewpoint, the tailwinds are blowing fairly at our back. Um, 
we have a lot of strategic end user uh, interest. And, uh, you know, as we complete the feasibility study in the mining lease application, um, we'll be in a position to, to update the market accordingly. The, the value unlock that comes with our refinery puts us again in a unique position in that not only can we produce those magnet and heavy rare earths, but we have the capacity to aggregate uh, products from other rare earth producers in the light rare earth space who maybe don't have the economy of scale to justify developing their own uh, medium and heavy rare earth separation. So we have the capacity to bring that product in and scale up production. And uh, finally, the magnet recycling piece, I think, is an area where we can bring that on relatively quickly, um, much faster than it will be to develop mines. Um, and the ability to replicate these across Europe means that we can roll out jurisdictional domestic uh, magnet rare earth production uh, that can be directly funneled into manufacturing here in Europe, uh, the US, the UK, um, and, and a couple of other jurisdictions that we're looking at now. So we do see, you know, a huge opportunity with what's about to happen in the rare earth space. So thanks. We're at booth 52 and, and open to, to any questions over the next couple of days. Thank you.